Konnichiwa. Hajime Mashite Bokuwa Ryan Grunenberg Des. Dozo Yoroshiku. Serverless Comp Tokyo Gatsuki Des. Hi. I would have to design this, sayonara. <laughs> Thank you, Ryan. Ryan wanted to practice his Japanese. Was it good? Yeah. Yeah, it was good. You guys liked it? Yeah. Everybody's giving a thumbs up. Excellent. Well, konnichiwa. Konnichiwa. That's all the Japanese I know, unfortunately. <laughs> I'm very sorry. But I love serverless, so I'm here. Um, look, thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you for joining me. Um, so, look, today I'll tell you a little bit about our story, about how we built an entirely serverless startup. Um, and I'll also share some of the core principles um, that we follow when building serverless architectures. So, I hope you may, maybe you'll find it useful. So, before I go any further, let me introduce myself. That's me. Uh, my name is Peter and I'm VP of Engineering at A Cloud Guru. I'm also a co-founder of a company called Serverless Heroes. And we basically specialize in teaching serverless technologies and serverless architectures. We do things like courses, workshops, conferences. Um, I should actually say that you know, I have an accent and I tend to speak quickly. So if I am speaking too quickly, just tell me to slow down and I will slow down. Don't be shy, okay? Um, I have a background in computer science. Uh, I got a PhD in CompSci back in 2008. Um, I worked for the United Nations in New York. Um, I worked for the Defense Science and Technology Organization back in Australia. And I worked for a consultant um, for, for a number of years as a consultant for a number of years. But yeah, I recently joined A Cloud Guru and have been working on servers um, ever since. So let me tell you a little bit about what we have built. Um, so about a year ago, we put some courses up on udemy.com. So these courses were about uh, basically teaching people AWS and helping them achieve their certifications. And so the whole thing went a little bit crazy. A lot of people liked those courses. And after a while, we decided to build our own online training platform. Right? We think that learning is social, should be social. So we had a vision to build an online training resource uh, with interactive discussions, gamification, and lots of, lots of stuff to make training interesting. And so in nine months, or oh, oh, it's about 12 months now, um, we have scaled to 18,000 engineers, so we have trained 18,000 people across 117 countries. Um, at any given time, there are, there are thousands of people using our platform in real time, watching video courses, doing quizzes, talking to one another. Uh, it's, all, it's all instant, it's all real time. Our system is completely push-based, it's completely event-driven, and it's all servers, right? There's not one server anywhere that we have to manage. There we go, we don't run a single server. So, the reason I'm telling you all this is to give you an idea that, you know, serverless isn't something small or experimental. We have built a large, well, large-ish production system that supports tens of thousands of users um, and it's all servers. So, you know, people can watch videos, um, they can do quizzes and practice exams, our site is responsive, we do a lot of things, discussion forums, etc. So I guess, why did we choose to make it serverless? Well, we felt that it gave us a number of advantages. We managed to get to market really quickly, right? We didn't have a lot of resources when we started. Uh, and I think in about four weeks, we managed to build a whole system, including a sign up, payments, online video delivery, practice exams, discussion forums. And we think that if we had taken that traditional web server approach, we would have never delivered 
this platform in four weeks. So that's how quickly we were able to do it when we went serverless. Also, we needed to scale fast and effortlessly. So when we built the platform, we knew that we would have a lot of users go onto the platform basically on day one, right? Because we had a lot of users on Udemy, and we knew that they would migrate over to our platform. So it wouldn't be like this slow trickle startup thing. We would have a lot of users, we would have to scale. And so Lambda, we're serverless and we built on Lambda, Lambda has done it for us. And finally, we wanted to offer a disruptive business model. You know, instead of paying you know, thousands of dollars for in-person training or ongoing monthly fees, our users pay like $30, right? And we couldn't do it without Lambda and AWS because we don't have any expensive web service that we need to run, we don't have any load balances. Pretty much Lambda as free cloud front enable our business. And I think it costs us, I think, 12 cents to deliver a course to a student when they sign up. It's interesting that we only pay Amazon when the customer is actually using our platform, right? When it is doing something of value to them. So when, you know, if we're idling, if nobody's using the platform, we're not paying anything because we're only paying for the time that Lambda executes. So that's pretty cool. Oh, sorry guys, I forgot to yeah, go through those. And look, over the course of building our platform, um, we kind of came up with, I guess, our five principles of serverless architectures. And these principles attempt to describe serverless in more detail. And look, it doesn't mean that you have to follow these principles when you build your application, but we have found that they help us. So I will quickly kind of walk you through what we think those five principles are, and maybe you will find them useful when you design your serverless applications. So, you know, this is probably the most um, important principles. Principle, use a compute service to execute your code, don't run a server. You know, um, your goal is usually to solve an interesting business problem. It isn't to fiddle around patching Apache or installing an update to your operating system. You can write a function to carry out almost any task, right? You can read and write to a data source, you can call out to other function, you can perform a calculation. And of course, the other compelling thing about functions and services like Lambda is that you only pay for the time that your code executes, as I said before. So this means that you're building milliseconds and not hours. It massively reduces your hosting costs. And if your code is good, if it's optimized, you know, you'll be paying very little, possibly. Um, look, of course, I have to be realistic. There may be scenarios when you, when you have to run a server. You know, you may have some old legacy software that you need to run. That's understandable, but try to, you know, not to do that. And so, we have, you know, there are a number of patterns and architectures that you can build using serverless architectures. And, you know, this one, for example, we describe as computer's backend, right? So this is where we have um, an API gateway. So that's an AWS service, as you know. We have Lambda functions, a request comes in, that API gateway um, instantiates a particular lambda function, um, and then it returns a response. You know, there are other architectures. This one we refer to as computer's glue. So this is where we glue together different services, right? So you may have a file that you put into, push into an S3 bucket that generates an event, triggers a lambda function, a lambda function may update a database, push, uh, an item onto an SNS topic that in turn can trigger another Lambda function which can do something else. So you can create these awesome event-driven pipelines, and I will talk about it in a second as well, um, that can allow you to, you know, that can make you really powerful. And you know, speaking of a compute service, here's a very interesting parallel. We say that Lambda 
is to compute what S3 is to storage. If you think about it, if you think about S3, um, S3 deals in objects for storage, right? You provide an object to S3 and it stores it. You don't know how, you don't know where, you don't care. There are no drives to think about. There's no such thing as too little disk space, too much disk space. These concepts do not exist. You cannot over-provision or under-provision S3. So let's look, at, let's look at Lambda. Lambda deals in functions for execution. You provide function code, and Lambda executes it for you on demand. You don't know how, you don't know where, and you don't really care, right? There are no virtual machines for you to think about, no such thing as server from capacity, too many item servers, not enough servers, no scaling groups. These concepts do not exist for you. They are all abstracted away. So you cannot over-provision or under-provision capacity in Lambda. It is just what you want it to be. And Lambda executes and charges you for exactly what you execute. Nothing more, nothing less. So you can see that there is a parallel between Lambda and S3. Uh, our second principle, when you design serverless architectures, try to write functions with a single purpose, try to make them stateless. Statelessness is a very powerful concept. It is actually that secret glue that makes Lambda and Azure functions and OpenWisk possible, right? It allows those platforms to scale quickly and handle an ever-changing number of incoming events or requests. It is actually often hard, at least it's hard for me, to sometimes say, what the granularity of a function should be, right? You make things too granular, and then you have a lot of functions to manage. You ignore granularity, and then you have created mini monoliths, which isn't a good thing either. We have kind of, in our system, tried to follow our judgment um, and you know, best practice as we saw, and we created a number of functions, so I'll just give you examples. So we have functions, but we have a function that allows our users to submit questions on our forum and submit answers. Vote up and down. We have a function called GuruBot. So that's a little function that each day tells our lecturers how many courses they have sold, you know, how much money they have made. We have a function that's responsible for taking payment. So when a new student comes onto our platform and they want to pay for a course, that function is responsible for charging the user's um, credit card. And we have a function that gives access to our videos. Because you know, if you are an anonymous user, you can't watch our videos, but if you are authorized, then that function will give you a signed URL to access the video. I guess number three, this is my personal favorite, design push-based event-driven pipelines. Look, these are awesome, they are super powerful, and they can really allow you to extend your architecture really simply. So an event-driven pipeline is one that kicks off thanks to an event, and then continues to propagate without any additional user input. So basically, one event triggers another event in a chain reaction. So here is a very simple example. We have a video transcoding pipeline. So we allow our lecturers to upload videos, and then those videos get converted to 20 different formats, uh, like 1080p, 720p, HMS, WebM, MPEG Dash, so that different users on different connections and devices can view our videos. So this is a very simplified uh, architecture, but in essence, this is what it is, right? Somebody uploads a file from their browser, it goes straight to an S3 bucket that invokes a Lambda function, which submits a job to Elastic Transcoder. So that's the service that creates other videos for us. The, that Elastic Transcoder creates new videos, pushes them into another S3 bucket, which pushes a message onto an SNS topic, which then triggers another Lambda function, which then updates our uh, database, and we use Firebase. And the cool thing about Firebase 
is that it is a real-time streaming database. So all users connected to our system and looking at our website receive updates from Firebase in real time. So as a user, you can be looking at our platform and you'll see new videos appear as they are created or transported by the system. So everything is push-based, everything is event-driven, there's no polling, it's all just kind of on demand in real time. Um, this, I have a few more minutes left. So this is quite a controversial one and uh, you know, I generate a lot of discussions when I talk about this. Um, you know, try to create thicker, more powerful front ends. If you think about a traditional free architecture, you know, you have your web browser, you have your web server and the database. So your presentation tier, your logic tier, and your data tier. And this very gives a nice separation of concerns. But it becomes very tedious to improve and maintain, especially in the world of rich SPAs or single page applications. So let's have a look at this traditional uh, model. So you may have a whole MVC framework in your browser with views, controllers. These services have to talk over the wire with the server, right? This is your traditional structure. <laughs> you then, so the message goes over the wire to your server, you then have all the layering um, on your server. So you have to authorize calls, validate input, you have to fetch models from the database, apply business logic, and then you have cross-cutting concerns as well. So if you have to add a new feature, you often have to touch every layer and that takes too long, right? I've had to work on systems in my previous job where I had 15 layers. I had managers, I had proxies, I had various other things. It would take me two weeks to add a button, right? Surely we could do better than that. So the cool thing is, with the explosion of web-based services and new security mechanism, well, maybe not so new, but security mechanisms like cores, JWT, JSON Web Tokens, SAML, something new becomes possible. Your front-end application can actually talk directly to different cloud-enabled services, including the database, which is quite interesting. It makes it possible to remove that middleman. So your front-end can talk to those services, and you can break apart your monolithic server. Of course, look, you can't always execute all the edge, you cannot always orchestrate all of the logic in the front end, right? There are certain secrets that have to be done in the back end. And of course, then you can use Lambda functions, for example, if there's something secret that you need to orchestrate. Um, or let's say, for example, you need to send an email you would never send an email from your user's web browser, right? That's insecure, it's bad practice. Then you can create a Lambda function to do it for you. But in a lot of cases, you can actually have your front end talk to those other services like the database um, directly. And it also means that the majority of your data transformation and business logic code moves into the front end. Um, and you cut out a whole layer of cross-network communications and data rendering, which is interesting. And so now when you need to add a new feature, you only add it to your front end and potentially call out to cloud services when required, when you need to. And look at how few layers you need to touch now. And so our platform is designed this way. We have the majority of our logic in our front end SDA, we use AngularJS, um, and then we have various cloud functions, Lambda functions that perform certain actions. And you know, this is pretty self-explanatory. Use third-party services when you can. They will allow you to you know, accelerate a lot quicker. Use S3 for file storage, use CloudFront for distribution of your assets. You know, we use Firebase for storing data and syncing to client, client devices. You can use Stripe and PayPal for payments. So there are all these services that you can leverage 
in order to focus on what actually differentiates you from your competitor. And look, we find that a lot of these companies like Stripe and PayPal or Firebase or whoever, you know, they do what they do extremely well. So you will pick up a lot of speed if you outsource certain things. So I guess, look, how do you get started? Um, you can follow our Twitter at a Cloud Guru. Um, we'll have serverless comp videos on it on our website. We'll announce when they're on. If you go to our website, um, a Cloud Guru, you will find videos um, from serverless comp New York. Um, so you might want to have a look at those. So we ran serverless comp back in May. Um, and hopefully we'll have videos from this conference on our site as well. And we have a bunch of awesome courses like the Atlanta course. Um, finally, we are writing a book um, called Service Architectures on AWS. Um, it is nearly done, um, but yeah, if you want to grab a copy, there's a code as well our publisher has given us for this conference. And I think you can buy any book with this code, so which is quite cool. Um, look, I guess that's it. It's a brand new world, but it's a lot of fun. Uh, the serverless movement is moving, it's maturing very quickly. Um, there are many tools and services that didn't exist a year ago that exist now, like serverless framework, which we use a lot. Um, we are really excited about uh, you know, what you'll be able to build with serverless technologies and architectures in a year's time. And we love the passion in the serverless community. Um, we think that you know, we expect great things to happen. And uh, finally, we are running serverless conf in London in the bottom month. So you know, you're all welcome to come. Please do. Uh, it'll be quite interesting as well. So thank you for listening.